Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you're watching my walkthrough for Chrono Trigger for Nintendo DS. This video covers Ayla and Luca's side quests, and towards the end of the game you can do these side quests in any order, but I'd recommend you start with Ayla's because it leads to some really good armor, which is very useful for some of the other side quests. In particular Luca's, but it's useful for some of the other side quests as well. So anyways, I recommend you start with Ayla. So if you speak with her in the end of time, she says, hey, stop by, you know, Ioka Village in 65 million BC, and there's a strong defensive item you can get there. So this is, that's our clue on how to do that. So if you hop in the epic and then swing on over to 65 million BC, you want to park near Laruba Ruins in the far, you know, top left, just north of the Ioka Village itself. And if you go inside to speak with a new here, then it will allow you to change the name of the character that's in your first slot. So whoever is your party leader currently will allow you to change that character. So just by swapping your characters back and forth, you can change all of your character names if you want to. Now, after you speak with the new the first time, it will also give you the Silver Gemstone, otherwise known as the Silver Rock in older versions of the games. And this will um, unlock the ability for you to use a triple tech while it's equipped on one of your characters. So next we want to head over to the hunting range. So just watch on screen, I'm going over to these little chunk of woods over here in the top right. And this is the location of it. It's kind of hard to find, so that's why I pointed it out real quick. So anyways, our goal right now is to get 10 of each one of the trading items. You can actually see them in your inventory if you go over to the key items tab, then you can see how many you have of each. But regardless, as long as you have 10 of each, you can then trade it in for the last item. Now at the trading post, they'll only trade you for that item. That's the only thing they'll do anymore. And it's 10 of each, which is pretty expensive, honestly. And you might have a bunch of parts already left over from other things. So the fastest place to get them by far is going to be in the hunting range. So, kill a bunch of enemies here, they'll give you a whole bunch of parts, and once you have a decent amount, you can go over to the trading post in Ioka Village. Now, as far as how many you should get, I would say, like, at least one ruby armor, if not, like, three. It really depends on what you got. Um, currently, I have some red plate. I actually have several red plate because I won them in the Arena of Ages. That's actually all I really need, and then that's actually better than the ruby armor, but uh, most of you probably only have one red armor and possibly a red uh, vest. So now, if you don't have that many items, Items, or you only have the plate or you only have the best or whatever, I'd recommend you get at least two ruby armor. So get however many you want and then you can you know, trade in all the remaining parts because uh, you can just sell any additional armors that you get. One of the only other things worth noting here in the hunting range is that you can get news to appear as well. They appear whenever it's raining and they will show up in either the top left, top right, or bottom right corners of the map. And if you can touch them before the rain stops, then you can fight them and they give you a whole bunch of parts when they are defeated. So that's a little bit nicer. So if you happen to see one, that's great. Um, so just try and run to one of those corners when it starts raining and hopefully you will find a new. So once you have successfully completed enough prehistoric animal genocide to satisfy you, you want to head to Ioka Village and speak with the old man here and toss over 10 of each each one of the trading items in order to get some strong armor. Now this is the ruby armor which has really good defense against fire. So we're going to be using that even at the end of the game because it's very useful for particular fights. So as I was saying, if you have the red plate and like the red vest, you just need like one ruby armor, maybe two is all you really need as far as from a fire standpoint. As far as just from a pure uh, physical armor value, this is actually an upgrade for all of our characters at this exact time. If you have just finished saving Chrono and finished the Ocean Palace, then this is, and like the black Blackbird and everything, then this is actually an upgrade for everybody. So you could spend some more time getting it. However, we are going to be getting upgrades for most of our characters in general. So get as many ruby armor as you wish. However, just know too, Luca is about to get an upgrade as well. And Luca's armor will also be resistant to fire as well. So it's redundant. We don't need a ruby armor for Luca specifically. So that being said, how many ruby armors do you get? I would recommend one or two, depending on what, what items you have in your possession would be minimum. And then max would be like six because Luca already has an equivalent or actually better. So next was swinging on over to 1080 and as long as we're in the area, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ayla and Magus to Chrono's mother for the dialogue, which is fun. And uh, this is, of course, not required. You don't have to do this. One thing I think is a little bit weird is that we don't have any other dialogue between Chrono and his mother. Like, it's just a little bit weird because, like, earlier in the game, we had the whole execution thing going on, the trial, and we didn't have um, any... We had some pretty intense dialogue with her at that point. She reacted very heavily, which makes sense. But now this time, she's just oblivious to it. Like, even though something way worse happened, you know, <laughs> Chrono totally died like he actually died this time and it was even worse and uh yeah it's like we brought him back to life a miracle happened and all this stuff but like we don't uh have any other dialogue with her about that at all i mean it makes sense it's not like anybody told her besides chrono can't speak anyway so it's not like he could tell her she's all like how was your day dear and he's all like 
Maybe Chrono's just super stoic, or he's just so manly, you know? So next we're heading over to Luca's house, and if you have your in your party when you speak with Tabin, you will then be gifted with Tabin's suit. Similar to the Tabin's vest being a little bit better version of the ruby vest we had once upon a time, so we have Tabin's suit is a better version of the ruby armor that we just purchased as well. So it does the same, like, defensive-y stuff, same armor and everything, but it also boosts her speed, and it also will reduce fire damage. The tooltip here says it halves it in the DS version. I think that's wrong. In the Super Nintendo version, it said it reduced it by 90%, so it's either comparable to the ruby armor or better as far as a pure fire standpoint. But anyways, really good armor regardless. But yes, I think the tooltip is wrong in the DS version, and it, it, at the very least, it does the exact same thing as the ruby armor. So just a really good item. Next up, we have Luca's side quest. If you speak with her in the end of time, she'll quote some of the things that um, Gasper said a little while ago, and she explains that solar energy could be just the thing that we need to fight Lavos, which just goes to prove that clean energy is totally hardcore. So then she shows a short cinematic showing the island that is in 2300 AD, so you can want to head there with the epic. It's in the far bottom left corner. Inside, we have the Sun Shrine, where we can find the infamous Moonstone. Now, before you move forward, though, you want to stop and pause here because we have a boss we're going to face. So as far as who to bring for this fight, I highly recommend Ayla would be my first recommendation because you can charm all kinds of good stuff off this boss, so it's great. So I'd highly recommend you bring Ayla. As far as a second recommendation, you can bring Marl because she can haste everybody um, because our damage for this particular fight is not based on our stats, so our power and magic stat don't matter. Uh, what does matter is our speed. Our speed is the most important thing to kill this boss well. So um, how fast you can go is really, really good. So you can accomplish this with Marl by casting haste on everybody. Otherwise, you can also accomplish this by putting on speed accessories, so like the speed ring, for example. Otherwise, you can also put on haste helms if you have them, or Angel's Tiara is even better. So those would be some options for you as well. Now, one other cool item you can use is the Dark Helm. It's male only, and that will have fire damage, which is really good for... So whoever has the least uh, magical defense, that would be a good option for them. And then otherwise, the last thing to know is um, you to put the red plate and red vest on whoever the lowest magic defense characters are that you have. Meanwhile, whoever is the highest magical defense character, in this case, Magus, and Magus actually has the highest magical defense in the game, I put the ruby armor on him, which will reduce fire damage by 80%. So the first thing to understand about this boss is he has a nasty flare attack that he'll just use occasionally and that just hits your whole party and it hurts like crazy. So unless you have a good counter for fire, then it'll just murder you. So that's why you need to put on a bunch of fire resistant gear. So once you have that taken care of, it makes it not as much of a problem. So the flare will just happen occasionally anyway, but also it'll happen if you attack the eye in the center. So whenever you hit the eye, it will cause a flare counter and that's really awful. So what we have to do for this boss is we have to find the appropriate flame, and when you smack it, then the boss will take damage. So what you want to do is uh, text don't make any difference at all, so like dual text, single text, it doesn't matter. It's not worth it. So just use regular attacks, and our goal is to just hit him as fast as possible and use process of elimination to find the appropriate one. So defaultly, when you go to attack, you're going to be selecting the core, and so you need to use either left or right on the D-pad, ideally, and then just select different targets is how you do that. So what I like to do is I will use like left on the D-pad like two or three times to do the, the two or three left flames and then do the two or three right flames from the core just by pressing those buttons. If you're playing the DS version, you can also tap the buttons that are on screen as well, so you can use that method too. Uh, so whatever way you want to do it, whatever way is easier for you to keep track of. I do feel like using left and right is a little bit easier because once you find the appropriate one that doesn't counterattack, then you can go ahead and start smacking it with your other, all your characters, except for Aloe. You want her to be charming stuff. I would highly recommend you only start charming after you find the appropriate flame because you want to choose which ones you're charming based upon the default position of the correct flame, which I know is really confusing. So in this case, it is in the far bottom right. So now I'm working my way clockwise going around, uh, charming all the other flames to get elixirs um, based upon the position of the first flame. Does that make sense? So if the correct flame is in position one, now, then I charmed number two, now I'm char charming number three, like that, so on and so forth, so that I can use process of elimination to figure them all out. Because once they start spinning, then they're all going to be mixed up again, and the icons that are on your bottom screen for the DS version are going to be all mixed up again, too. So if you're using it, if you're figuring them out based on that instead, it can be really confusing. So that's why I recommend you use left and right, at least for charming anyways. So the boss does have a pretty nasty dark beam as well, which does shadow damage, and that can hurt pretty bad. If you have the dark helm that you can wear on one of your guys, then that can reduce shadow damage a lot as well, which is kind of nice. Um, now, he did hit Ayla pretty hard, but I'm not too worried about it because she's wearing the red plate, and so every time that she gets hit with any kind of fire attack, 
It's just going to heal her instead, so I don't really have to worry about it too much. Pretty much the only person I should have to heal for this fight should be Magus. Now just so you know, because both Magus and Robo are Shadow Element, they take 20% reduced damage from Shadow, so as a result, the Dark Beam doesn't do as much damage to them as it does to other characters. Also, Magus in particular has a the highest magic defense stat in the game, so as a result, he takes less damage from all magical attacks, just generally speaking. So I'd pr probably say overall he's one of the better characters you could possibly bring for this particular fight. So as you probably realized by now, every time that the boss uses roulette spin, it mixes them all up. However, one thing to, to know about that is that the positions to, of each flame relative to each other is always the same. So once you find the appropriate flame, you can charm the other flames relative to the position of the correct flame, which I know is a mouthful that's really confusing. So at this point, I actually already charmed position number four and I forgot. So anyways, I found, I think I mixed up which uh, flame was correct for a second there. Anyways, so now I'm hitting the correct flame. So now I just, the I've charmed one, two, three, and four. And now the last one is five, which is going to be just backwards one. So once I find the, once I have Ayla available and I'm going to charm number five. So there we go. Boom. I have now just successfully charmed all of the flames. By the way, in case this wasn't obvious already, we've been charming for like most of the game and I haven't actually even talked about this so much. When it, whenever it says this enemy has nothing but gratitude to give, that means that um, that particular charm attempt failed. So it's just a miss, basically, is all that is. I just wish they had called a miss instead. I don't know why they have this additional dialogue. I think it's confusing and misleading, but regardless. So whenever it spins, you need to find the appropriate flames once more, uh, but I'm still working on position five. So I know that the fifth flame still has stuff. So here I found the appropriate one, so I'm gonna charm the, again, going backwards. So it's gonna go back one, it's gonna be position five. So yes, as you can imagine, as opposed to just the buttons on the bottom DS screen, you can see why I think the D-pad is a little bit easier for charming anyways, you, because you want to charm the flames relative to each other is why. So my highest priority for this fight in general has been using everybody to find the appropriate flames. I was just using regular attacks for that, but once I found the appropriate flames, then I was charming them all. But now, finally, that all of them are finally successfully charmed, I'm going to charm the boss at long last, who actually has the most valuable item, which is a black plate. Now, if you've been following along with me, we should have gotten one of those black plates from the sealed chest, so this is how you can get a second one, which is super awesome. So in that way, because you can get various bosses for these side quests that give you another plate, you have two of each color plate, and you get one vest of that color as well. And as a result, you can then have a full party of three that can completely negate one element. This is one of those battles where I feel like having Aayla in your party is really smart, because there's just so many good items here. Elixirs are pretty nice anyway, but the fact that we can get five of them plus the black plate here is kind of crazy. Although it is like really Really awkward and confusing. So if you find this super annoying and the whole idea of this just, you just find it obnoxious and you don't want to deal with it, you could charm just like one or two flames and then charm the boss. But yes, of everything though, I would highly recommend you charm the boss for the black plate. Super valuable. I really, really recommend it. It's very important. So once you finally defeated the boss, then the Son of the Sun will then go to the far north and it will revert back into a moonstone, which is completely depleted so it doesn't have any energy. I'm going to switch to Luca too for the dialogue purposes because this is all her side quest. Um, some of the other characters say similar things, but I think Luca has the most interesting dialogue for this whole side quest, and she is also required for some of the sections anyway, so just for the next little while, just have her as the leader of your party. One thing I don't quite understand is how this, like, shrine even got here. Like, I don't even know where it came from. It was earlier, it was in the sky, you know, in Zeal. However, after the Magic Kingdom fell, then it just, like, disappeared. Like, there was nowhere to be found. Like, everything else crashed to the ground, right? So maybe it was submerged underwater or something? I don't understand, like, what happened to it in between 12,000 BC and 2300 AD. It doesn't make any sense why we have access to it in that time period. Anyways, now that we finally have the Moonstone, what you want to do is go back to 65 million BC, and we need to let this charge up in sunlight for a long time. So there is a cave that's in the far top right corner of the map that is called the Sunshine. So place the Moonstone here in the sunlight, and then we can use the Epic to move through time so we can collect the Moonstone after it has been upgraded to a Sunstone after it's soaked up a bunch of goodies. However, when you arrive back in 2300 AD, you'll see that the Moonstone has gone, so it has been removed sometime between 65 million BC and 2300 BC. So instead, next you want to go to 600 BC, you'll see that it is still here, so it hasn't moved. However, the reason we came here in this particular time period is to grab the strength capsule that is just to the left. So after you grab that, continue on back to the epic and go to 1080 this time, where you will find that the moonstone is indeed missing. So somebody took it in this time period. So at this point, if you fly around in 1080, you will quickly find that there is a glowing house that is in Poor Village in the far bottom left corner of the map, which is very suspicious. So you want to park the epic nearby and enter to figure out what's going on. 
I'm thinking if the whole house is sparkly, that means that the whole house is a save point, right? Inside, you can speak with the mayor, and he says that he's never heard of a moonstone. However, everybody else in the family says that he is super greedy, and that he loves money and such, and they all hate him, which is kind of terrifying. What a terrible legacy to have, or like, have everybody in your family despise you, so, oh, it's just bad. But anyways, if you go to the same house, or the same position anyways, the elder's house in 600 AD, what you'll find is that everybody there is really poor, because they're in poor village, eh? Um, but they are, the wife there wants to cook with spiced jerky, but she doesn't know how to get a hold of any. It is available for purchase here in 1000 AD though, so here, the same thing in Poor Village, over to the right, you can go to the snail stop and speak to the chef behind the counter to purchase spiced jerky, which costs 9,900 gold, which is very expensive, but you should have more than enough gold at this point, so don't worry about it too much. By the way, side note, you can only, there are two side quests that require the spiced jerky in this game, and this is one of them. You can only have one spiced jerky in your inventory at any given time. So next, we're going back to the Elder's House in 680 this time, so get back on the epic, go through there, speak with the woman here in the kitchen, and she will see that you have spiced jerky, and she wants to buy it from you for 10,000 gold, which is actually 1,000 gold, pro or 100 gold profit, but totally not worth it. What you want to do is give it to her for free, because she will be shocked by your generosity, and she swears that she will raise her kids to be upstanding citizens and be noble and be generous, etc. So, because she was inspired by your generosity. So go back in the epic, go to 1000 AD, enter the same house, and speak with the mayor, and this time he is now, he'll just give it right back to you immediately. He admits to having it, he'll say he just found it out in the middle of nowhere, and he'll give it back to us for free, claiming that we looked like we probably needed it more than he did. The kids, meanwhile, are all happy with him and say they adore him, but the wife does kind of wish he could just be a little less generous, you know? And then meanwhile, the girl upstairs has a funny comment because she doesn't understand big words, apparently. So this is a great example, too, of a gold sink. I was talking about this back in the Blackbird chapter, but this is a great example of... Uh, game developers putting like some expensive uses for money so that it feels more worthwhile so that you actually have something to soak it into I guess. Um, so this side quest is totally worth though the money is like not a big deal totally worth it. So anyways with the moonstone in hand you want to bring it back to the sun shrine in 1000 AD then you want to turn go to 2300 AD to pick up the fully charged sunstone. So this will lead to us getting two new items, the first of which is the Wonder Shot, which is Luca's most powerful weapon. And the tooltip for this is slightly complicated, but basically, just so you know, what happens is this weapon can either, it randomly does either very low damage or very high damage and stuff, but just so you know, the overall chance and the overall damage you get with this is definitely higher than any other weapons she has access to in the entire game. So this is definitely the best choice for her. Totally, you should put it on. Also, fun fact about it, I know that the tooltip's kind of overly, comp this whole mechanic is overly complicated and stuff like that, but if she has happens to hit for three times damage and then she gets a crit on top of that she can hit for well into the thousands and she hits really really hard very low chance of that happening but just know that it's a thing so yeah luca's best weapon then a tabin will show up and he gives us the sunglasses otherwise known as the sunshades and this is an item the tooltip on this is very vague but what it does is it's an accessory that will boost your uh, physical and magical damage by 20 percent when worn one quick note about this side quest is it's very important that you do this side quest before you do Marl's, and the reason for that is because we want to have the sunstone in our inventory um, after completing this quest because then we can use it to get some additional items at the very end of Marl's side quest. If you complete Marl's side quest first, then you will miss out on the potential items you could have had if you had done this one first instead. So yeah, do Luca's side quest first. One thing I always thought was strange about this quest is that Luca sucks all the energy out of it, so couldn't we, if it's depleted like that, couldn't we like take it back to 65 million BC and have it charge up again? Like have multiple multiple moonstones charging up through history and then make multiple weapons out of it? Wouldn't that be crazy? That's awesome! <laughs> uh, but anyways, that's actually the end of this quest and also the end of this video. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, be sure to throw a like on it, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content just like this. As always, stay awesome, have an amazing day, and I'll see you next time.